Hello, and welcome to WIT Presents. I'm Kathleen Duncan, the AAW WIT Committee Chair. During the pandemic, the WIT Committee has undertaken a number of activities and online presentations to keep woodturners connected with one another. This week, we are completing our second virtual exchange. Registration is now open to watch the presentation of projects next Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern. This series of WIT Presents is another of our pandemic activities. These are not demonstrations, but are an opportunity for one of our women artists to share her journey through her art. I'd like to remind you that if you have questions for Joey, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. To communicate with other attendees, use the chat button. Our presenter today is Joey Richardson. Joey grew up on a small farm in Twigmore Woods in England. Don't you love that name? There she developed a deep appreciation for trees and wood. She attended an all-girls school, which unfortunately did not have wood turning or even a woodworking class. They did have art classes, but Joey tells me this was not her forte. What led her to turning, oddly enough, was a very serious car accident and a very, very lengthy recuperation. As she embarked on her career as a wood turner, others recognized her talent and she was awarded several scholarships and monetary awards to fund her studies. Although most of us recognized Joy for her thin, pierced turnings, the one piece that really intrigued me was the tree house that she built as part of her Master's of Fine Arts Studies. I hope she'll share that picture with us today. With that, I'd like to introduce you to Joey Richardson. Joey? Hello. Thank you very much, Tib, Kathleen, Andy, and Janet um, for organizing this and for everybody else who has been behind the scenes. It looks like you've all been working really hard to keep things going during the pandemic. And I'd also like to thank everybody that's um, given up some time now to um, listen to this presentation. So I'd like to start with a quote. Um, this is from Frank Lloyd Wright. Wood is the most humanely intimate of all materials. Man loves his association with it, likes to feel it under his hand, Sympathetic to his touch and to his eye, wood is universally beautiful to man. And I think that's so true. And I think we're all extremely lucky to be able to be working with wood. So this stool and this bookcase are the very first things that are made out of wood. As Kathleen said, um, I went to an all girls high school. Um, it wasn't that art was for me. I actually got thrown out of the art classes at the age of 14. And I did, couldn't do woodwork, couldn't do anything I was really interested in. It was a very academic school. And uh, I left at 16 and went to work in the bank. And then I had this car accident and while I was recuperating in hospital, I wrote a bucket list. And one of the things that I really wanted to do um, was to make things out of wood. I'd enjoyed growing up on this very small family farm. I'd enjoyed the trees. I'd enjoyed making little jumps, my pony and boxes for my chickens. So as soon as I could um, walk again, uh, I enrolled uh, at an evening class and I made this stool and this bookcase. And it was here that I fell in love with the turning. I actually really enjoyed turning the legs for the, this stool and this bookcase. That class folded and I ended up going, um, getting myself a little lathe and just having a go myself. And then my son was born, he's 28 now. And mum said, I'll have him one afternoon a week and you go do something. And I enrolled on a turning and carving class. She was very disappointed. She wanted me to do something ladylike, like cake icing. Anyway, the class happened to be run by Chris Stott, who many of you may remember he has demonstrated for the AAW 
quite a long time ago and on numerous occasions. So I was very fortunate um, and I was going along quite nicely. And then I cut my finger off on a bandsaw. Um, luckily, they got it sewn back on and I got a plastic tendon, but it took quite a few years to get right. And I lost my confidence. So Chris made me enter a competition at Wembley and the theme was time. And this was the piece I made. I did the planets. All of these are hollowed out. Each of the spheres are hollowed out. And I got a runner-up award. So that just spurred me on. Um, and I started making pieces. And I actually funded most of my workshop through making pieces, entering competitions, um, and getting the prize money. Then in 2005, I was very, very fortunate to be awarded a bursary award from the Worshipful Company of Turners. Ironically, they turned me down in 2003, and then they approached me in 2005 and said, would I like to, to do it? So I wanted to come to America. I wanted to come to the symposium. And most of all, I wanted to train with Bin Foe. Very sad we've lost Bin, and that's a very, very difficult part, I think, for all of us, because he was such a great guy. These are two collaborative pieces that, that we made together. I think Bin really moved the wood turning forward with his colour, his ideas, his themes. He was absolutely wonderful and I owe an awful lot, lot to Ben. When I came over to America, um, he arranged for me to have two days with Trent Bosch, two days with David Nittman. I came to your symposium and I had three days with Ben and it was the most inspirational time that I'd, I'd had. It was absolutely unbelievable. Um, so I went back and I made quite a few pieces which weren't very good um, and I kept developing and developing and practicing. Joy, I think you muted yourself. the Sphere Exhibition. And I wanted to, I was making platters, uh, plates and flat sort of floral forms. I wanted to keep all my techniques the same. So I used all the same techniques, the airbrushing, the piercing and everything. And I came up with this, again, floral form, but for your Sphere Exhibition. Hello. You're you're back with us, Joy. Did you have you? Uh, okay. So I developed. I kept developing my work, and I went from cutting the uh, very small flower with the the two ways, and I combined that with the sphere, and I came up with this shape here, which is a sphere but it's got two layers to it where I carve it all away so that it overlaps. And this is the same shape again, but this time I made it into a wall plaque. And this is how you can see the difference of how you display something. So these are two pieces that sit on the wall and you can either put them together or you can put them apart. So the one in the top left corner the two pieces of work are looking outwards. Now that makes me feel uncomfortable and uneasy. 
So although everything flows in the middle, it doesn't actually really flow. And in a lot of ways, I would display that if I was having a bad day and don't talk to me. You can just swap the pieces round as in the bottom right and they come together and that feels a lot nicer and a lot cosier. And that's a good day you can talk to me. This again, it's the same form. Um, and I've put this into a big piece of, of burl. And then this is the same, but I cut three layers and then carved it all away so that you come up with some fingers. Um, an awful lot of carving in that piece. So I just kept developing and practicing and developing and practicing. And here uh, it's the same form, but I put a walnut um, tail and piece all around that. And this is the same again. So I started to use the sycamore and the walnut and put the two pieces together. And then I got invited into a teapot exhibition. So again, I used the sycamore and the walnut and I came out with this teapot. And then this is the same form again. And this time I've cast it in glass. So in 2012, I was very fortunate. I got a scholarship um, from the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust. Now the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust, it's the charitable arm of the Royal Warrant Holder Society. Now to get a, a Royal Warrant, you've got to provide goods or services to the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, um, or Prince Charles. And then you go through a very lengthy process which takes years, and if your work is up to standard, um, and you've provided them with these goods solely for four years, then you can get your Royal Warrant. And what the Royal Warrant holders do is they um, get together and they support craft. And I was very fortunate that I got mine for wood turning. Now again, after I've gone through um, a car accident and my accident cutting my finger off, I, I stumbled upon this scholarship and doing the glass again by accident because my work was in Del Mano Gallery, and as you all know, Del Mano went bankrupt and I actually lost my money. Um, and it was Bin who was doing glass, and it was Bin who said to quite a few of us, you know, you need to do glass. Um, it'll get you picked up by other galleries. And so I got my scholarship and again, funded me to come to America. And I came um, and I went to Hugh McKay, who's probably the only person I know who can cast anything that's thin and pierced. This is some more, this is wood um, with one glass petal. So again, I turned um, a, a tall form, I cut a petal out of it and then cast that in glass. So that's a combination of the wood and the glass. Now I get my inspiration from all over. And I think when I was talking to Kathleen earlier, uh, that was something that came up as where do you get your inspiration from? So when I was over in America um, at Art Palm Beach, I got up really early one morning and went to this nature reserve and I got this absolutely fantastic photograph fantastic uh, reflection in the water because it was so still and then from that I made this piece. So the inspiration for this piece has actually come from, from the colours and the morning and the feelings that I had when I was there. This is a different piece. Um, now I went to a photography exhibition, I was quite getting into my photography and I saw this piece by Brent Sturton and it was called Deadly Medicine. And he'd taken a photograph of two rhinos that looked to be kissing and you actually looked at it and you thought, oh, that's a nice picture, but it made you feel uneasy, something was wrong. And what was wrong was one of the rhinos didn't have a horn. And it inspired me and it moved me so much. I actually wrote to him and said, would you mind if I make a piece about uh, the plight of the rhinos? I'd actually been on a safari uh, in Africa and I'd seen these magnificent creatures and then to see Brent's photos, it was quite horrendous. 
So here I turned a rhino on, I carved it. Um, half of it's black for the black rhino, half of it's white for the white rhino. There's a window and when you look through the window at the opposite side, there's a pierced rhino showing how fragile they are. But inside there, there's a pestle and mortar because what's happening to these rhinos is they're being killed and all the people want is the, the horns because it's supposed to be some fantastic potions. They use it to make um, knife handles. They use it as an aphrodisiac. All it is, it's keratin and the rhinos are going to be extinct. So you can look through the window, you can see the pestle and mortar and then in all the piercing, um, oh sorry, all the texturing on there, you can see lots of different images. So inspiration comes from everywhere. This is the Queen's Estate at Sandringham and I was very fortunate that I could get some trees from there. Now all of the trees I get, most of my wood comes from Twigmore um, and the Scorby Estate where I grew up as a child. I use sycamore, which I think is like a maple, uh, which is a maple, I think your nearest is, is maple and the nearest wood to it to turn. And the sycamore tree is a wild tree, it grows everywhere, it's a weed, nobody really wants it. And these trees get felled at a very early age in the life and they go for firewood. So because I've got this Quest scholarship and they was going to fell these trees to make room for more recycling skips, I got the chance to go pick a tree and, um, and to save its life, it was just going to go into the wood chip burner. And this is the piece that I made from the tree. So the inspiration for this piece was Sandringham. So we've got the Sandringham flower show. We've got the butterfly sat on, a solid butterfly, but he sat on pierced flowers to show how fragile life is. At the bottom, we've got the flames because the tree was going to go into the wood chip burner. In the texturing, we've got lots and lots of images and we even we go, I take this right back to the caveman and how wood has been universal to man. And we circumnavigated the globe in the first wooden vessel. We used the wood for shelter. The caveman came out because he could light a fire and make shelter with a lot to owe wood for. So I put a lot of that in the texture in all at the bottom and brought that up all the way through to our day. Uh, the petal on the left, it's got a cut in it because Steve, who was doing the photography for the day, he'd just had an operation. And everybody who was there on that day helping is represented in here. And it was a wonderful feeling to get this tree. I was so excited and I came back from the Sandringham estate and I started making the piece. And I was listening to some new music and one of the records was called Methuselah. Now Methuselah was the oldest man in the Bible and it all fit, it fit the piece because this piece was, tree was going to die very young and now hopefully it'll live on to be a grand old age. Now I do a lot of loose butterflies. All of these butterflies are turned. Uh, so I turn a bowl and then I cut, cut the wings out and then I make a body. And these are the three butterflies that it was on Methuselah. Now, if you look, the first one, the bottom wing, it's in the shape of a molar tooth. And that's because the chairman of Quest had toothache and that's his butterfly. The second butterfly represents Steve who was doing all the photography on the day. But also the land agent of Sirencester, and you can see the land agent of Sandringham who went to the Royal Agricultural College at Sirencester. And the Royal Agricultural College colours are there at the bottom of the roll of film on the second butterfly. Because the land agent had graduated, got his job and he'd flown away. My son at the time was at the Royal Agricultural College and so he's represented right at the bottom of the piece as a caterpillar because he hadn't quite um, graduated. And the third butterfly, if you look carefully, the bottom wings on that are chainsaws. Um, and that represents the two guys who cut the trees down for us. 
Now, I use a lot of symbolism in my work, and the butterfly has been a very big part of my work, and there's always a butterfly in my work. Now, the children and I have had a lot of struggles in our life, and I relate this quite a lot to the butterfly. Now, the butterfly struggles to get out its cocoon, but it's the struggle that gives it the strength in its wings to fly. And so every time we have a struggle and my children have a struggle, I always used to say to them, it's making you a stronger, more beautiful butterfly. I put horses in quite a lot and that goes back to my childhood onto this very small farm because we had no neighbors and had a horse and it was my freedom, it was my friend. There's an awful lot there of symbolism around the horse. I've then been very fortunate and the Worshipful Company of Turners who gave me the first bursary award to come to America and to train with Ben made me a freeman of the company. Um, then they made me a free of the City of London, a liveryman of the company, and I'm now very proud to say that I'm actually court assistant. So the master here, Peter Gibson, after his year of master, his wife asked me to make a piece for him. So I can put a lot of inspiration in my work of my stories, my feelings, and this is how I do it if it's for somebody else. So Peter had had a fantastic year as the master. So if we look at the bowl, we can see um, the, the horse on the, that's the Remy symbol, the horse on the world. It was the Queen's Jubilee, it was the Olympics, we've got the Olympic rings there. We had a great exhibition at Guildhall. Everything in the piercing and the texturing sums up his year as master and what he did. There must be 30, 40 different images hidden in there. Now, Peter always jokes with me because he says that I'm not a proper turner because my work isn't brown and round. So I didn't just make him this bowl, I put it on a little bowl box. And when you open the drawer of the box inside there, I turned a very, very small brown and round bowl just to prove I could. And in that bowl, as you can see on the right, I made out of some of the bowl, I made a lemon meringue pie. And on the bowl, one of the butterflies is getting quite fat because Peter did nothing but complain when he was master that he had so many meals and he put so, so much weight on. So you can have a lot of fun with the pieces. He's got a fantastic piece. He's got all his memories in there. He's got his brown and round bowl, which is full fun. He's got his, he's got his pie. Been very fortunate again that I've done two commissions for Fabergé. Um, Sarah Fabergé is a liveryman of the Worshipful Company of Turners and she's been asked to give some award for the Restaurant Association. So this was an egg that I made on behalf of Fabergé and I worked with Sarah and she gave me some gems to put in it. And inside there there's Yorkshire puddings and there must again be 20 or 30 different images in here that all relate to the recipient of Brian Turner. And then again, I did one for the three generations of the ruse. So what to do in cases like this is I, I research the person. So Albert Rue was holding the French cockerel. The favorite place of Michelle Rue was his library. Inside there's the butterfly with the his wings at the Eiffel Tower is on a spoon stirring some eggs. Um, there's the Michelin stars on there. There's three generations of the Rue family all incorporated into there, along with Fabergé and a copy, well, an artist impression of a copy of a tree that was on a cigarette case, a very old Fabergé cigarette case. And there's three branches of this tree and there's a ruby and an emerald and a pearl, and these uh, represent the three generations of the Rues who received this award. So I've been very fortunate and I've exhibited my work 
um, all over the place. And here I was at Sofa and Ron Girton came up to me and he said, oh, I like what you've done with, with your glass. If you would ever like to do um, metal, you know, let me know. So I said, oh, yeah, that's great. So anyway, I said, well, I'm coming to Florida. I'll pop, you know, to Art Palm Beach, I'll pop over. I was thinking he lived in Washington, D.C., and it was Washington State. So it took me eight hours to get to Florida and then 13 hours to get there to this very, very small Tri-Cities airport. So, um, so that was quite fun. And here I am in Ron's yard playing with fire. I've had an absolutely fantastic time and Ron and Vicky made me very welcome and I've been and I've stayed with them two or three times and we've had absolutely great fun. And this just shows how one thing leads to another. So Del Mano went bankrupt. So I got my bursary, my scholarship from Quest. I did the glass. Ron saw the glass, did I want to do the bronze? So I started playing with the bronze. Now we're very fortunate with wood because another way for your inspiration with wood and to put a story in is wood has its own story, wood has its own history, it's a tree, it's alive, it's been growing, it's where it's grown, there's all sorts of things and the piece on the right is um, a bronze bowl I did with Ron and that was one that I'd already done in wood and glass. The piece on the left is a piece of burl that we cast and this was in Ron's wood pile that he was going to burn and the irony of this piece is Ron reuses everything, absolutely everything and he all the off cuts and he makes pictures with them and yet this beautiful piece of burl he was going to burn and I said right I'm going to have that because that is the story that it's Ron's piece of wood he was going to burn it and, uh, and now I've made it into bronze and then I did one of my turn pieces on there and of course the butterfly as always and put more stories and images into there so that was the bronze piece and that's the original wood and that's the glass so when I was with Ron the first time, um, we chatted and I said, well, you know, this 3D printing, what if I could get a 3D print of one of my pieces and we could cast direct from that instead of mold making? So I arranged to, get, arranged to go back and see Ron and I went to my local university. And I said, could I please have a... Uh, 3D print and you know you pay for it and things and the guy there said well why don't you come and do a MA in fine art and you can then play with all this equipment so I said well I can't really do a master's I left school at 16. So he said oh no they'll take you on work experience so he made me two appointments and the first appointment was with the design guy um, the head of design what would you like to do well actually I'd like to come and I would like to play with the equipment and he told me to come back when I got a better idea. But the fine art guy said great and they gave me an unconditional offer and that was a massive shock for me and it was a very very hard two years because I'd left school at 16, I didn't know how to reference, I didn't know how to write critical reports but I'm very proud to say I've come out of it and I got a distinction. Now this treehouse I actually made for my uh, second semester and the gentleman who took this is one of the royal photographers who's just done a lot of photos of the Queen. The treehouse that you see here is um, in my garden of the our old house um, which is we're currently selling and it's got a thatched roof you can just see that in the background. The treehouse it's all made with disused scaffolding boards and reclaimed timber, which again is from my childhood home and estate of Twigmore and Scorby. And all the barks, the rough cuts, um, when they make the fencing stakes, they cut the bark off. I printed the curtains. I took photographs of the bushes down below and I printed the curtains on silk so that 
you can stop the light coming in. And I took photographs of the bark and I printed that on some thicker material and I've got a full six foot bench in there. It's an absolutely fantastic space and I really, really miss it now I've moved. I think we're going to have to build another one. The teapot I'm holding there, the photographer could have picked any piece he wanted and ironically he picked that piece which is now in the collection of Dave and Karen Long which I'm so pleased about because Dave and Karen have been great supporters of me, my work and of the AAW and for so many artists. And Karen has always made me welcome when I've come over as a woman traveling on her own, she's always had a little goodie bag for me with lots of American goodies in it, which has been lovely. This teapot I made was called Tea of Peace and it was the piece I made after Bin died for a teapot exhibition and it's the story of Bin. So why did I make a tree house? Well, in true Joey fashion, I was at uni and I went to a symposium, a, which was called Doing Deceleration. Well, deceleration was the last thing I was actually doing. So I was trying to be a mother, be a wife, run my wood turn in business, do my demos, be at uni. And I went dashing off to university, got stuck in a traffic jam, and I missed the train to go to Nottingham to go to this doing deceleration. So I chased the train all the way there and every station I got to, the train had left just before me. So I arrived at this symposium went rushing in, it had started, I was out of breath, I couldn't speak, I had to park my car in this most expensive car park. I was so hot and bothered, I got some water and I spilled it, and everybody in there was all chilled and calm, and there was all these artists talking about how you need to stop, how you need to contemplate, how you need to take time and think. And when I sat there, I suddenly realised that the demands of my many lives and many identities, I, I never have time to stop. I never have time to think. There's no contemplation. I need somewhere to go to escape. And that's why I built this tree house. I don't want to destroy nature or habitat. So that's why I use the reclaimed wood. And I like it, I like it to live on. A lot of my work, there's quite a lot of memento mori in it. And again, this would a reminder of my childhood home. I want to go in my tree house. It's a retreat. Uh, it's intimate, for personal reflection. And when I'm sitting up there, it actually clears my head and it gives me a clear perspective. And it actually allows me to take back control of my life and enables the freedom and development of my thought and allows for my creativity and to, for me to explore ideas. So this was one of the pieces that I made for my final um, show at the university. And this piece is called Destination of Experiences. It is autobiographical. Um, in many ways, all of my art is autobiographical, as I'm always present and I do use art as an exploration of myself. The base of this shed is five foot four, which is my height. And distillation of experiences transforms a story into a narrative and it actually permitted me to make sense of my life. Um, it is this narrative that allowed my memories and experiences to be transformed and developed into artistic inspiration. And I suppose life and art all became one. So this has 128 panels, all pierced panels, and each one depicts something different on it. Now, I like to use a lot of polarisation. I like to use the piercing against the solid wood, the texturing against the smooth wood. And this sheds no different. Um, it's actually solid structure, but it's fragile. It's actually a manly structure, a man shed, but actually I've made it uh, feminine. 
Now, whilst I was making this shed, um, it was going to be a combination of all my experiences at university, my tree house, my contemplative space, and the shed that I sit in at home, or my studio that I sit in at home and I do my artwork. Whilst I was making this, um, my son got diagnosed with multiple cirrhosis and my world just fell apart. Now this is how, when you're making a piece, the meanings can alter. So instead of this piece, been in a light room and been a contemplative space where I was going to allow the viewer to go into it, maybe sit and write notes. I actually didn't want that. So I put it in the gallery and blacked out all the windows because this was how I was feeling. I put one single light inside. That was the light of hope. And that cast shadows on the walls. And I shut the door. I didn't want anybody in there. That was how I was feeling, just shut everybody out. These are two of the panels. Um, there's pigs on the left and that was one of the guys who did all of his work was about pigs. And there's some underpants on the right. One of the other guys on the course decided he was going to print underpants. So although the meaning of the shed kept changing, there is a lot of fun in there. This was another piece that I made for my final um, degree show. The wood that I carved these exercises, and I keep going back to wood, I've, I did ceramics, I did metal, I did printing, um, loads and loads of things, and I kept going back, back to wood. Now Sheffield um, is a city that's about 40 miles from me, and Lincoln, where I went to university, is about 30 miles from me. Now, neither Sheffield nor Lincoln had ever played a big part in my life before. Suddenly, my son gets multiple cirrhosis and his treatment's at Lincoln and I'm at Lincoln University. And his consultant is at Sheffield Hospital. And at Sheffield, they was cutting down all these magnificent trees and the government got involved. There was riots and they had to stop. Now I went over and I interviewed the council and I interviewed the residents and I got some of this wood and I decided to carve uh, out of this wood. Now that I carved an axe. Now why did I carve an axe? An axe has so much meaning. An axe can be a very creative, but also an axe can be very destructive. Going back again to my woodwork, I decided to cast the axe in glass. So you can see there, there's two axes that's all wood. There's one that's all glass. There's one that's got a glass handle and a wooden head and the other one the other way around a wooden handle and a glass head. Why did I do glass? Why did I, you know, I'd got my wood, I'd got my story. There was a story of the trees where they'd grown up, why they was being felled. Well, at the time, I was feeling extremely fragile and glass is fragile. If I drop that wooden axe on the floor, it may crack, but I can mend it. If I drop that glass axe on the floor, it's going to shatter into a thousand pieces. And that is how I felt our lives were at the moment, they were shattering. How was I going to display them? Well, this bog oak came off my friend's farm and it's thousands of years old and it is so hard, this bog oak, that you can't actually attack it. And I'm, I'm angry. The bog oak has a lot of meanings um, and the axes are attacking it. So I'd cast them in glass and I'd carved the axes in wood. And then I used the mould and I cast a lot of axes in ice. And each day I went out and put an, a glass, a, an ice axe on this piece of bog oak. And so it melted. 
And this is how I felt. I felt cold. I felt numb. But there's hope. There's always hope. And inside these glass axes, I put lots of seeds. And hopefully, when they melt, these seeds, some of them will be carried off and they will grow. And, and that's the future. And that's a close-up of it. And I cast lots of isologs and isologs with sawdust in them and I left them all melting and again there were seeds inside them so I'm hoping now that they're starting to grow at the university. And this was a piece that I got from the pile of wood at Sheffield of all these trees that had been controversially felled and every time a tree was felled um, the Sheffield Tree Action Group which called themselves STAG Put one of these notices on it and this piece happened to be on this heap of wood. So I got this piece and I displayed this in the gallery, stood up in the corner, painted the walls so it had that coffin-like look to it. I needn't do anything else with that piece. The story is in the wood, the story is in what Stag put on it. It's just how you display it. I went back to my tree house then to contemplate everything that I'd done at uni um, and the sadness and the happiness. And what I decided was that each of my pieces, I'd actually designed them to extend into the future and into a future body of work. And that will continue to evolve and grow as, as I have grown throughout the journey. Everything I've learned from my art will move both my art and myself forward. And it was all of the combinations of my thoughts, my hopes, my fears, my longings, my guilt, the hundreds and thousands of emotions that are linked to me and more importantly to my art and I look back at all the work I've made and I think this is something I've never done before. Why did I make that? How did I make, why did I make it like that? And I suddenly realized that everything I did came back to me being a mother. My responses to the situation I found myself in, um, that I'd weathered, the artwork that that had produced and that it's all tied up in this reflection um, and it become apparent to me that deep down, a lot of my work is all about being a mother. So that made me realize that you can alter pieces as you go along and it is all right not to know sometimes what you are doing um, because there will be a reason for that. So if you go through the bottom of a bowl when you're turning, why have you gone through the bottom of the bowl? Is it because your mind's on something else? And if your mind's on something else, what is it? And then that is part of your story. So then I decided to take some of the panels which I had um, done for my shed and to make more affordable pieces of art that I could sell. So I did some embossed prints and that's a close up of it. So then I have the original wood piece and then some embossed and colored prints. And again, I started this at university and then I went to a um, print workshop and that's near me. When you go out and you go to different exhibitions and things, it's quite nice for people to be able to take away something that's a smaller, a smaller piece of work. So I left university and one of the guys who I left with, we put on a print fair and then he booked the gallery again and he said, we're going to do a retrospective and he called it, are you with me? And it was all of my work and apparently or at uni, when I was trying to explain myself, I never used to say, oh, do you understand me? I used to say, are you with me? So he called the exhibition, are you with me? Now the gallery, if you ignore the walls in the middle, this is where I've learned a lot about display. The gallery was just one big open space and everybody that has an exhibition in it just puts pictures on the wall and plinths around the outside. Well, my husband built me all of these walls and every time you went around a corner, you saw something different. So there was some excitement and it is all about how you display it and 
not letting everybody see everything at all. This was the opening. We did drinks and a lot of people came from outside of Lincolnshire. So we had Lincolnshire potatoes. I made the chip forks with, I, with me on it. And my friend did a big cater and all of Lincolnshire food. And it brought everything together. We went right down to the detail. We had the catalog, the food, the chip forks, everything was all linked in. This was a full size easel and I'd been making butterflies. So this was a piece all on its own. All the butterflies could be purchased separately. So here we are with the shed displayed differently. So this is how, when you display something, you can have another meaning. So at university, I was very sad. I had to have it dark and I shut everybody out. The exhibition, I was feeling a lot better and the door was open, the light's still on, but people could go inside. And this is looking down, so you can see looking down through it, the roof, um, the leaves that have landed on the roof, the such that have pierced the birds in the trees. So following on from that, I made a screen. So there's five panels on here, spring, summer, autumn, winter, and then a tree. Again, this can be displayed backlit, so it comes out in a darker room, or you can use it as a screen to screen something off. So there's 25 pierced panels in that. And then I've done a plinth, which is next to me. I call this respect me. Everybody looks at the work on the plinth and nobody cares about the poor plinth. So the plinth has got the center of uh, attention here. And then I decided I needed to have some fun. And my children and all my friends' children had Ikea furniture when they were younger in the bedroom. And this table is the Ikea lac table, which I think was like four pound when it came out. So I've put the table on a plinth and suddenly that gives it a whole different meaning because the table's on a plinth, so it's a piece of artwork in itself. And just to question it more, I've put a bowl on it. So what is the artwork? Which is the plinth? So that is the lac table. Now, if you look in the background, you can see the four lac legs screwed into a wall with no top on. So I call that piece legless lac, sorry, topless lac, topless lac, because there's no top and the legs we used to display work on. If you look at the bottom, you can see the tops there, but no legs. Um, so I call that legless lack, and I had a tree root growing out of it. A lot of fun and a lot of things to think about there. And then we've got half legless, and I pierced the top, I cut a hole out and I pierced the top there. When you read a title of a piece, when you see this is half legless, you actually know it should be displayed like that. But if you don't read the title, there is a few people coming in saying, oh, did you know your tables collapsed? So a lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of thought, and it's it, getting people thinking. And this is a close up of the table, um, of the person, of the butterfly and the flowers. Then I took the Ikea light and I stuck on it 64 turned pierced butterflies. I took off the plastic. And then the Billy bookcase. I'm not sure whether you all had the Billy bookcase, but all our children had the Billy bookcase. And so what I did was I took the back panel out and I pierced the three Billy Goat Gruff stories. So we've got the Billy Goat Gruff on the bridge and we've got the troll and the, we've got the troll being butted off by the goat and then the pierced shelves on there. Put a bowl on top of it as well. Is it a bookcase? Is it a piece of art? Lot of thought in there. So then we come to lockdown. Now lockdown has been quite challenging because all of my family have been on the front line or in, they've had to go to work. With my son having MS and his treatment, his immune system's low, so it's dangerous for him. My daughter who lives on her own got COVID and was really poorly, but she'd actually got 
COVID-induced gillian Barry syndrome, and my husband is a GP. So it's not been the most um, easy of times. And this is where I enjoy my art and my work. So I had a friend who was doing gilding, so she gave me a little lesson um, and I started doing some gilding. And then I decided, I never used to make the shape of the piece before because Bin always did them. Then I decided I was going to do different shapes. So I did this piece here. And this is a window series. So before the dog would sit looking out the window and now we're sat looking out the window because we couldn't go out, we weren't allowed to go out. So these butterflies here are looking out the window. So they're getting ready to come out. And some have come out and some still locked down. If you look as the piece is coming round, you can see now there's a red bit, it's just coming green now, and then it turns to red. And as that keeps going round, and that is red for danger when we're not allowed out, and green for the fields and the grass when we can go out again. And that I cut and I airbrush two different ways. Um, quite a lot of symbolism in that. And then I decided to teach myself marbling because I wanted some brighter day series. I needed a bit of fun. I needed a bit of colour. So I did some a brighter day series and I did marbling and gilding. And this is one of the first window pieces I did with the butterfly with the key on locked down, looking through the window um, and the darkness of it all. And then we ended up having all everything cancelled, all our exhibitions and everything. So I cleared out the kids sitting room in the house, used the bookcases at the back as they were, put some plinths up and three of us had an exhibition in there. And it was marvellous. We sold a lot of work. We followed all the COVID guidelines and we had a little walled garden. We gave everybody a glass of fizz, tea, coffee and cake to hold them there so any so many could go in. Such good feedback and fantastic sales that we decided to set up and call ourselves Gallery Gallivant and to travel around and be an artist, artist led collaborative gallery and to put on exhibitions. Now, unfortunately, the next one's been cancelled because we've been in lockdown, but we are planning, we are coming out of lockdown and we're planning one in the next couple of months. So now I'm going to go um, and show you my workshops. Now what's happened is I've actually moved home in as if lockdown wasn't stressful enough. Um, we've actually moved home. So this is my tree house and the views I get from it. So here I come out of it. I've got a roof I can lay down there and I can see the stars. When I go into my tree house, I don't look towards my studio. There's my studio, there's my house. I look the other way. And then I have a drawbridge. And when that drawbridge is up, everyone knows not to contact me at all. Not to contact me. It's my space, my time. That's very symbolic. There's always a dog pleased to see me. And this was my COVID stockpile. Cut a load of wood for COVID and got it in the freezer to keep it nice and fresh with the odd tub of and Dars in there. And there's nothing more, everybody likes a few shows in there, so I'm going to have to put um, a few shows in there. I used to have wood, and when I take it out, in the middle of the building, it's really wet. Really it's just like fresh green wood, it is so therapeutic. So this is the turning dead. Just a few techniques. So when I've turned it, I start to cut it up. So I have this little handheld saw and I cut all my edges with it. And then I carve them down to make them look nice and thin. So they're all carved down. And then hours and hours of sanding so that I get a nice edge. Uh, I normally airbrush a mask up with frisket but if I'm doing something small I mask it with masking tape and if I, there I've covered the butterfly so I can airbrush around it 
A lot of the airbrushing I do is I make my own stencil. So I get the acetate, I cut out the stencil, I put that on and then I layer it with the paint. So golden acrylic transparent paint put on with the airbrush, layers and layers of the transparent paint and you get a great effect. A lot of pyrography in my work. Um, I pyrography the lines so that the paint doesn't come through. I pyrography the lines up to where I'm going to texture so they get a nice sharp edge. This is the texturing and I do this with a NSK Presto air compressed drill and it's the same drill I'm using here to do the piercing. And this is how I do the piercing. Um, 400,000 RPM, it's very fast air compressed drill and that's the and that's the person I've now moved and I've designed these stables and I'm just in the process of finishing finishing these stables off of where I'm going to work so they're all individual so the first one here is where I'm going to do on my gilding and my airbrushing and it's my clean studio. I'm a daban now at putting down laminate flooring. Um, so at the back there where those are, I'm going to have desks, more desks so that I can teach and demonstrate. It's important to me from what I've learned at uni and my treehouse that I can see. So I've positioned it so I've got a great view out the window so I can escape. And I've got all that long bench there that I can, I can work on. And then when I start teaching classes, when I'm finally fully set up and I start teaching classes, that's a photograph of Twigmore in the back there that I took. At the back here is where I'm going to have more work desks. So we go out the first studio and into the second studio. And in here, it's where I'm doing my piercing and carving. Again, I'm gonna have more desks there at the back for when I'm teaching. Um, and when I sat in here, I thought, I can't see, I can't see, the view isn't good enough. So I got the guy who was building them to cut a hole in between the two studios and put a window in for me. So it keeps the two studios completely separate. So the dust can't get into the airbrushing one, but I've got a great view. Um, out of the window there and there is quite a few more stables down here no just have another quick round go round not quite got all set up properly with my um, studios yet but we are getting there I've got all my extraction system things to do the next one here, I'm going to have my compressor and my wood store. We're supposed to have horses, so the next one's going to be for a donkey. Um, there's Andrew's got the corner one as his workshop. I've put a, a bathroom in here and a little kitchen unit, so I don't have to go into the house. I can stay down in my stables. And then this is going to be the turning studio. So we're still in the process at the moment of insulating it, putting, putting all the insulation board up and putting it in and boarding the ceilings and the walls. But it's important to me to get a view. So we've put some windows in here so that I get a, a great view out the window so I can totally escape. So thank you very much for listening. Um, and those are my details if anybody wants to contact me afterwards. Thank you very much, Joey. That was wonderful. Great to see your work and your inspirations. And if uh, participants have questions for Joey, please put them in the Q&A section. Uh, looks like we have a couple right now. There's. Um, Early on, there was a question of, of what size lathe did you start with? Um, I started with a really small little um, draper lathe. And then I went to a great big one. And now I've got a sort of a me just medium size. And a comment, a couple of comments came into the Q&A. Um, 
One from Sandy Hughes. Thanks, Joey, for the print inspiration. I've been playing with block printing and your embossing is so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it, 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 it is cool. Um, I enjoy doing that. And uh, David, David Holly, uh, you're an inspirational, you're inspirational for sure. <laughs> um, and a uh, question here, um, is the NSK the only piercing tool you use? It is now. I used to use the Power Crafter and then when I went to Bin, he said he preferred the NSK because you don't have to oil it and it's more powerful, although it is slightly noisier. And I tried the NSK and I, I really, really liked it. So yeah, it's the only way. I used to pierce it. When I first started, I just had a Dremel and a drill bit because I didn't have any proper bits. So that's all I used to use to start with. Um, but now, yeah, the NSK Presto, it's definitely my opinion for my work. It is the best tool. Great, thank you. And a uh, question on the panels that you do. Uh, can you give a sense as to how long it takes to do one of the panels? So the panels, when I'm doing the embossed print, I do everything with my NSK Presto. When I come to do my shed, it couldn't cope because it had to be stronger wood and the Presto just couldn't cope. So the hours of work in one panel has suddenly increased because I had to draw them all by hand. So by the time I've drawn it all by hand, had the wood been thinner, I would have cut it with the Presto. Once I've drawn it, you then have to go into Photoshop and alter that so you can get it into the right file. And when you draw, you never draw cleanly like you do when you pierce. Um, so then you take it to the laser cutter when you've converted the file and the laser cutter cuts it and then you check it and you realize what's wrong. So you go back into the computer, you alter your drawing um, laser cut it again, a lot more sanding and, um, and hand finishing with it. So the hours of work in the, each panel is a lot. The only advantage with it now is provided I've saved the files, which is another problem, but provided I've saved the files, if it got damaged, I could then replace that. I could then cut another one. Um, so yeah, I, I couldn't tell you how many, the hours in each one when I worked it out um, was quite phenomenal. So I decided I better stop thinking about it because then when I've, when I've done that and sanded it, I then go on with the interference spray so that where it's burnt, uh, where it's cut it, then I interference spray so it's purple. Then it all has to be sanded again. Then it has to be lacquered. And there was 128 of, of those. Thank you. And a question, are the panels solid wood? Yeah, it's um, laser ply that I actually get. Um, so it's a solid piece of ply and then I cut, cut them, um, cut it out of that. So you can see on here, look, there's an edge all the way around it. This is the plinth. So there's one, two, three, there's four on there. So there's the butterflies in the top and I leave them um, about this much all the way around to keep each piece solid. Great, thank you. The handheld cutting tool that you were using, is it a, a, a mini jigsaw or scroll saw handheld? Oh, it, yes, it's a mini jigsaw. It's the Proxon, um, the one that I use, mini jigsaw. Great, thank you. Um, and do you have, um, have you, well, have you collaborated with others in your artwork? Uh, yeah, I've done a few different um, collaborations. Um, not too many. Ben, I collaborated with um, quite a bit. And at uni, uni we did quite a few um, different collaborations. So I ended up painting and, um, and then someone brought some wood in and I, I went back to my childhood when the motorway came through the, the farm and really... I was really distraught, so I covered all these tree branches in concrete. Can you talk a little bit about the process of casting wood into glass? Oh, it's really, it's a quite, it's a really long process. So you turn, it, it's, it's the lost wax 
process. So I turn the piece, uh, do all the piercing, do all the texturing, but no, no colouring on it. And you then make a mould. Um, out of your mould, you then make a wax model. You then invest that wax, and as the wax, and put it in the kiln, and as the wax melts away, you, um, the glass goes in, then you get your glass, and then you've got to, to polish it. So it's a very lengthy, it's a very lengthy process. And I've done, when I was at uni, I did ceramics, I did metal, I did glass. And every time I came back to, to wood, it was my, definitely my favorite medium to work with. And do you have a preferred wood that when you're with, to work with when embellishing? Yeah, sycamore, um, which is like your maple um, and your, um, oh, what's your wood where you get uh, the red beetle in it? Oh, that's the... Um, that's similar. Um, box elder burl, box, box elder. elder. Yeah. Box elder, it's very similar to sycamore. Right. Um, but I use sycamore because it's close grained, so it pierces nicely. It's white, so it colors nicely. Um, you can put it in the freezer. It turns beautiful. It doesn't crack. And, and it's a weed, it grows everywhere. And it, it, they just, it just ends up as firewood, it's going, you know, so rather it, I'm not cutting down some exotic trees. Um, so it's all, I always like to think I'm saving its life. We have several uh, very nice comments and I'll read one of them to you. Um, I am a carver, not a turner, but I find your work and Bin Foes as well to be extremely inspirational. Thank you for adding beauty to the world. <laughs> Thank you. And um, truly interesting presentation, fantastic work. Uh, let's see, a question on the price of the NSK. Um, do you have a sense as to what they might cost? Yeah, I think they're about, about 400 pounds and you can get them from, um, Bin used to sell them. Um, that's where I used to get mine from. And I think Craft Supplies USA sell them. Mm. I'm sure Craft Supplies USA sell them. And is um, a question on the sycamore. By freezing the sycamore, does this keep it white or um, not discolored or is it just to keep it green? Um, it, it does everything. It keeps it white so it doesn't discolor because sycamore you're supposed to um, stand it on end, uh, but it still discolors and it still goes gray. But if we cut it fresh and put it in the freezer, um, it keeps it white. And it also, like I say, when you take it out, it still it turns like fresh green wood. Could you please um, is, um, voice your, tell us your contact information again? I don't know if you can put that that slide up, probably not, but. No, I don't think I've got the screen anymore. Um, okay. if you go onto my website, uh, it's just joeyrichardson.com. And on there, there's my email, my Twitter, my Instagram, everything's on there. It's, so just joeyrichardson.com. Great, thank you very much. Um, and comments, I appreciate seeing your personality in your work. And I admire the fact that you're willing to explore many different mediums to do your work. And that looks like it's about it. This has been phenomenal. I know it's very, very late. Um, I, I'm overwhelmed. You have given us so much and I am going to have to look at your artwork in a totally different way. And I think probably when you have your art, you should have the history, the story behind it, because there's just so much, there's so much detail and there's so much in each of your pieces. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. We, we've all appreciated it. Thank, thank you very much for asking me and thank everybody for, for listening. This has been great, thank you. Uh, a reminder, please fill out the survey that you'll get because um, 
our, our uh, presenters all appreciate your comments and I'm sure Joy will appreciate them. And again, I'll thank my WIC committee for making it happen and doing all the work behind the scenes. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Please be safe and stay healthy.